Ladies and gentlemen, please welcome back to the stage Margie Graves. Good morning. I hope you enjoyed yesterday's program, and I believe there was a great deal of insightful and productive dialogue that was generated. I was very pleased to hear the exchange of ideas that were coming out of the sessions. And in a few moments, we're going to hear from the United States Chief Information Officer, Steve Van Rokel. First, however, we want to spend just a few minutes to bring you up to date on our new Institute for Innovation. Please welcome Andy Robinson, Chair of the Institute's Innovator Circle, and Sarah DiCarlo, Director of the Institute. Good morning, I'm Andy Robinson with ICF and Chair of the Institute for Innovation. Joining me is Sarah DiCarlo, the Director of the Institute. The Institute was established in 2011 to promote innovation in the delivery of government services and operations. We develop high quality strategic advice that reflects cross industry recommendations based on a consensus of experts from ACT and IAC member companies and government liaisons. This is made possible through the kind support of our sponsor companies, MITRE Corporation, which is our research partner, ICF, Evolver, Trusted CS, a Raytheon company, and the Ambient Group. If you'd like to get involved with us or sponsor the activities, contact Sarah or I, and we'll, we'll be glad to have that discussion with you. I would like to thank Sarah. She corrals busy executives, SMEs, and gains consensus on intellectual property. We know that's like herding cats, but Sarah, we, uh, we love you for it. We thank you for it. You're doing a great job. Thanks so much, Sarah. It's my pleasure to talk with you uh, for just a couple minutes, which is hard for me, for those who know me, uh, about uh, some of the projects that we have going on, uh, both last year because uh, the hurricane, we were not able to recognize all those volunteers who gave so much time under the leadership of Ann Reed and Molly O'Neill to make our quadrennial government technology review papers really come to life. So if I could ask both those who volunteered for what we're calling the OMB project, Steve, and the quadrennial teams to please stand and be recognized. Uh, this is your, your moment to be thanked, at least in this forum by this group. Thank you. There we go, yes, great, thank you. The, the quadrennial papers, actually, um, it was great to hear some of our speakers on innovation. Dr. Cuckoo talked about the importance of the STEM issue uh, for our business and for the economy, and that was the focus of one of our papers. And then I heard the White House fellows talk about the cost of preventable disease, which was the focus of another one of our papers. So I'm glad to see that they are still highly relevant topics. In addition, we did a paper on a budget deficit, we did one on citizen-driven government, and then we did an overview paper. And you can find those on the ACT-IAC website. They're actually not too long, kind of an easy read, I would say. And uh, you just look under act, uh, actgov.org slash quadrennial. So that's, that's an easy spot, or just find them under the Institute webpage. Uh, so today, uh, let me just segue into the project that we're doing right now for OMB that we call Transforming the Way Government Builds Solutions. Um, we, we actually heard it again from the White House fellows about their uh, ideas for simplifying the list of procurements and reusing um, a DOT application and some databases to make their projects work. And that's actually at the core of, of what we're talking about in our papers as well. And uh, so Steve threw out to us a challenge about buying, how can we better buy, build, and implement 21st century solutions characterized by, and this is sort of a mouthful, modular development, rapid innovation, agility, and seamless integration of reusable components. And of course, all this is informed by open data and APIs. So we, we focused, we set up four teams, and we focused on uh, the, building how we could better build scalable modular solutions 
And how do you find these resources in, you know, to, to be used? What, there are a lot of challenges just around that area. And then, the, of course, the idea is to make these recommendations stick and be ad adopted by government and industry. And Steve made sure that we understood that this was a, a collaborative effort to make this all work. So we have developed four recommendations, and we have actionable strategies. We're closing in on having the paper finalized. Um, it should be done in just a couple weeks, like a few other things. They got derailed a little bit uh, because we uh, are lucky enough to have both government and industry on our team. So we, um, we hope that you will take a look at that paper when it comes out, and we'll make sure that everybody is aware of it. And uh, we're looking forward to, uh, to showing it to Steve and his team. Uh, let me say, Steve, that we had about 75 volunteers come together to work on it. It's a lot of volunteer hours, so we hope that you'll find it valuable. Um, next, let me talk about what I think is just going to be the coolest, very coolest, innovation award that you're going to see. It's called Igniting Innovation, and we are going to, um, we have, the nominations are open now. It's a very simple nomination process. One of our team members said some of these innovation, you know, award programs are so complicated, so we decided to keep it very simple, so it's an easy application. Uh, also found on the banner of the act I act website. So go there. The nominations are due November 15th, not the 16th and not the 17th, the 15th. We already have over 20 nominations submitted. So uh, we're looking forward to so down selecting to what we're calling the top 30. Those 30 will, are going to be invited to attend and um, promote their solution at a showcase at the Ronald Reagan Center on Thursday, February the 6th. And all of you are invited to come and bring your colleagues at no cost uh, to come and see the top 30 innovations in our government today. So the, the innovations can be uh, products, they can be solutions, they can be processes. Um, we just ask that it be something that you can look to results in 2012 or 2013, okay? So uh, you could even re show us how you repurposed something and brought additional innovation to it for greater results. We hope that this will draw innovations on a national basis, be national in scope. And um, let's see, what else? You do not need to be an act I act member, okay, to submit. So if you have customers or are aware of others who are doing innovative things on behalf of government, bring them on, okay? So there's no charge to submit, so there should be no barriers. We hope everyone will come and help us make this a great success. From the top 30, we're going to have our judges select down to the top eight. Uh, and that's, uh, excuse me, that isn't quite right. Back up. <laughs> it's early in the morning. Okay, the judges are actually going to give five awards, like a science fair. You know, they're going to go around and, and give, give awards that they'll do. But those who attend are going to have an app to vote using social media voting. And they, all of you, will select the top eight who will then go to the stage and do a five-minute pitch, like a VC pitch. And we're going to have four luminaries who will be like our voice. I don't know who's going to be CeeLo Green, but you know. <laughs> um, so anyway, who will give some commentary on this. And those in the audience will vote again. It's going to be highly transparent. It's going to happen click, click, click. And our Igniting Innovation awardee will be announced at the end of the session. So it's going to be a lot of fun. It's going to be very different, very energizing, and hopefully very educational to see what's going on around government. So thank you very much for the time. And don't forget, November 15th is the date for submissions. Thank you. Now it's my pleasure to introduce the United States um, Chief Information Officer, excuse me, I'm losing my voice, Mr. Steve Van Rokel. Steve was appointed as the government's second Chief Information Officer in August 2001. And over the past two years, he has shown that he is focused on moving the country forward. 
He has met with many of you in the room and has shown that he is committed to the principles that are at the foundation of ACT IAC, improving government through collaboration. Please joining me, join me in welcoming Steve Van Rokel to the stage. Morning, everyone. Hope you're doing well. I like these teleprompters up here. It appears very, very presidential. <laughs> Maybe you'll have a special guest later today. Um, it's, uh, it's a pleasure to be here at, uh, at my first, believe it or not, ELC in Williamsburg. I was slated to come last year, like many of you, and the weather events, the tragic weather events, held us, held us back. And, uh, and it's great, uh, great to be here in, in, in uh, what, for me, is a pretty exciting time. Um, for, for many, many reasons. I get a lot of condolences walking down the hallway as well as excitement and, and uh, encouragement about the, the path ahead. Uh, and Dan and I did take off our ties as we were coming in this morning. So I think when we crossed the beltway, we had permission to do that. So you all now have permission to do it and feel free to do it. You know you want to uh, go from there. So I'm gonna talk a little bit, there you go, good job. I'm going to talk a little bit about uh, our priorities for uh, fiscal year 14 that we just uh, just went in. But before I do, I thought I'd, I'd look back a little bit. Uh, and since my last public speech, which believe it or not, was probably about seven or more months ago, uh, a lot has happened in my life, and I'd, I'd uh, bring you up to date. Uh, about six months ago, in May, the president uh, asked me to step up as the, the acting deputy director for management of OMB. And uh, when they put this request forward, if you remember, Danny Werfel was sort of in that job in some way, and then uh, he went off to the, uh, the IRS after some things happened there. Uh, and they had a person in the pipeline but asked me to step up and, and take on this job as acting deputy director. And little did I know, you know, that not only would I be US CIO and acting deputy director for management, uh, but there are also other, two other senior vacancies. So for the last six months, I've had four jobs, uh, three of which are Senate confirmed uh, positions. And so it's been a bit, bit of a whirlwind. Uh, there's these strange little humans walking around my house that I've got, not gotten to know that are seven, five, and three years old that I'm excited to get to know again. Uh, now that uh, Beth Cobert has been confirmed as the deputy director for management, I get to know my kids. Uh, during that time in the last six months, one of the most exciting things I think we were able to do was initiate the president's uh, second term management agenda, the work, the kickoff for this. Uh, on July 8th, the president held his first, uh, first cabinet meeting focused entirely on management, or focused in large part on management, and then went out and made, uh, made public statements. And I encourage you, if you haven't seen them, to go check out those public statements. I blogged about them on the White House website. Uh, with a link to the video and, and a little bit of uh, stuff we th did there. We then went on to ask uh, around government, uh, in industry, prior administrations and others, we did a lot of, of, of outreach to understand from, from lots of people, what is the art of possible? What are the things we should be doing and focusing on in government? You're gonna hear a little bit about some of that, uh, some of what I learned uh, in the priorities for 14. Is, and as we sort of think about the president's management agenda and where that's going to go, you know, I think there's lots of things that bubbled up and were very consistent across everything that we heard uh, from folks. We also had the pleasure of going through a government shutdown, first time in a long time. That was uh, not pleasurable, uh, but it was, it was good to get the government back open um, and get, get back to regular order in some ways. And I'm excited to, to kind of get the, get the steam, the engine going again. Those three weeks were somewhat of a hit on a lot of, uh, a lot of my partners in the federal government as well as the industry that relies on the government. I mentioned Beth Colbert being nominated or being confirmed as DDM. She actually was voted on by the Senate the day of the government reopening. Uh, and, uh, you know, something I'll phrase as teachable moments have happened since, uh, since the government's reopened on October 1st. Uh, you've probably heard a lot, I imagine a lot of you have talked in the, uh, in the hallways about uh, some notable federal website uh, traffic or lack thereof and some other things. Um, I, I'm not going to talk about Business USA that much, uh, but no, there, you know there is a there's a lot of dialogue going on publicly uh, about healthcare.gov, and I thought I would take a minute just to 
kind of talk about my perspective here and, and what, uh, what I think is really essentially a teachable moment for government. It's, it's where those things that, that I've been preaching, that Dan's been preaching, that many of you carry forward into the federal sphere have been preaching around the necessity to change, the necessity to evolve, um, uh, were, uh, were sort of realized in some ways and not in others. And I, I, um, I'll, I'll talk about that now. First, but one of the key things I want to note, and this doesn't get a lot of coverage and a lot of, a lot of discussion out there in the public, is the boldness by which the, the approach was taken on this project. Um, you know, we, we should all be proud of the fact that something this complex, this integrated to legacy systems, and there are mainframes out there that this thing hooks to, uh, was done at internet scale uh, and taken online in this way. I mean, just the fact that we have transactions moving between federal agencies using open data, using modular development, using technology in a way that, that, that you know, moves really from a, from a 19th and 20th century government paper approach to an online approach is, is something we all should be proud of in the federal IT community. And thinking about that boldness is, is key to where we go forward. You know, our, our goal here is to, is to definitely fix this thing and make sure it's working and meet you know, people's expectations, because uh, I can promise you our expectations are even higher than those outside of government. But I think we, are, we should be proud of the boldness by which we approach this. Uh, it is a complex project. You know, I mentioned connecting to, to legacy systems, uh, you know, the, the, the fact that we're moving transactions around securely and, and respecting privacy and, and, and controlling for, for lots of things. There is incredible complexity out there. And that, in that complexity, you know, sometimes in V1, things just don't go the way you expect. And, you know, I've, uh, you know, my many, almost two decades at Microsoft, I shipped products that, uh, that had similar issues. I actually had to recall a product once uh, that I actually had sold through to the, to the partner community. It hadn't sold, uh, sold into the partner community, it hadn't sold through to customer yet. But it was a, uh, it was uh, something that, a lesson learned for me on, on what we needed to do to get the technology right um, at the end of the day. So even in large multinational companies, this stuff happens. And, and, uh, and I think the key there is, you know, what do you take from this? Is this a teachable moment for you? Are you learning? Are you taking that learning and, and focusing on some, some key stuff? And so our goal, you know, number one, hands down, the president reminds us every day get this thing fixed, make sure it's working, and meet, meet Americans' expectations on this. And as a side, you know, our focus, my focus, is also about what can we learn from this? How can we learn? And what, what can we take from this experience to say we shouldn't do things uh, this way in the past? It's often you know, notable risk-taking or notable failures that often teach us how to do things differently in the future. You know, a lost laptop at VA uh, you know, inspired a new way of approaching the, the authority of the CIO and the budget and everything else. So it's things like that that we can seize upon and use as those moments to, to live the things we've been talking for many years. Another key focus is then from that learning, go on and do continued reforms and, and take, take that learning forward into what we do. I think we need to get very aggressive uh, in, in reforming uh, many aspects, and I'll talk about those in a second. Uh, as well as pushing the pushing the uh, uh, needle on, uh, you know, smart risk taking, lowering the risk surface, so failures are are not as as risky, and and uh, and thinking differently there. And then the last thing, and, and this is something we should all embrace, is continuous improvement. You know, waking up every single day saying not using the that's the way I've always done it as an excuse to move forward, but instead. You know, I need to do things in a different way. And so, and so thinking about continuous improvement is, is essential here. Uh, and that's, it's in the hands of everyone, from the person at the help desk, the developer, the project leads, the CIO, the head of the agency, uh, all the way up um, is, uh, is essential to think about continuous improvement and trying new things and doing things in new ways. So my priorities for, for FY14 and, and beyond, uh, three of these will look very similar, innovate, deliver, protect, it's some of the themes here at the, at the ACT IAC ELC. Um, I added a, a fourth very important one that I think is, is uh, you know, it's the undertone of almost every conversation we have in federal IT, and that's about people. You know, how are we thinking about the people inside government? You know, when you talk about the innovation agenda, uh, talking about STEM and creating a, a vibrancy in the, in the marketplace of the United States as well as in the private sector and public sector, <clears throat> people are at the heart of that. And, and uh, uh, it's essential 
to think about, you know, how are in government are we attracting and retaining talent? In an environment where you have sequester, you know, driving uh, morale in a, in a different direction than what you'd like to see, in many cases furloughs at agencies where people are getting a, a pay, or, you know, somewhat arbitrary pay cut and sent home on certain days of the week. Um, in the midst of all that, it's really hard to attract and retain top technology talent in government. We have some of the best and brightest. I mean, I've worked side by side with people in government that far surpass some of the people I worked with that are some of the most elite people in the private sector. Uh, but for the future and thinking about, you know, as the cyber security threats evolve, as we build the next solution, as we think about how to, how to drive innovation forward in government, it will be the people that we attract and retain that'll lead us uh, on that path. Um, so a part of that is, is training and redeploying, you know, keeping up our, uh, our training and thinking about how do we, how do we train and, and drive uh, uh, that, that new wave throughout the people we have in government, make sure they're up to date on what they do. Now this is a category where it's becoming easier and easier all the time from the standpoint of online courses and things that you can do uh, from that standpoint. Redeploying is about as we drive efficiency into government, <clears throat> and you eliminate, you suddenly take an agency from 20 email systems to one, you're gonna have a lot of email administrators out there. And I think on the redeploying and reskilling re uh, standpoint, we need to think thoughtfully about not only the, that, the cut part of the, of the equation on, on driving those cost downs, but how are we investing in our people and, uh, and training them uh, to be to redeploy, to do more meaningful work inside the, uh, inside the agencies. External resources are also important and will be a priority, priority for me for 14. This is the continuation and the scaling of the Presidential Innovation Fellows Program, looking at how do we bring in external talent to work side by side, partner with, with government. We've also, discovered, we, we've also discussed a, re, a reverse of that, where federal employees could take a turn out in the private sector and do work there. Um, if you go check out the last uh, President's Management Advisory Board meeting, we had a presentation from Jonathan McBride, who's now the head of presidential personnel, talking about this concept and how we're, we're sort of at the early stage of thinking about this. And then the last is managing the expectations. You know, both on continuous improvement and thinking about performance of agencies, how do we keep our people engaged to a point of thinking about the outcomes that they're driving? What is the impact I'm doing? I think for too much of what we do is at the tactical level. People think, you know, I come in in the morning, these are the set of things I do throughout the day and then I leave at the end. Instead of what impact am I driving? What am I gonna drive in 30 days, 60 days, 90 days, you know, a year? And then how do I back away from that to understand what things I need to get done to go drive that impact? And turning the lens slightly on that and, and thinking about impact and thinking about driving that is, is hugely, hugely important. We need to move out of tactical into the strategic and think about how that, uh, that impact is weighing. The innovate category, that would be a lot happening in, in FY14 in, in innovation. Uh, kind of a, one of the new focus, focuses you're going to see in this category, because I've talked a lot about economic growth and open data and the things we've been doing there, both on the mission side of government as well as how do we deliver uh, opportunity for the private sector to use government data and, and to, to drive this outside, is around the new category's effectiveness. You know, we need to think about innovation as it applies to serving our customer, the American people, the American businesses, and things like that. If you go up to a, a web browser, Google, and type in, you know, how do I export my product and limit that to government websites, you'll see probably 10 agencies represented on the first page. Um, you go to USA.gov, a federal website for aggregating content. Uh, the number one search on USA.gov is about driver's licenses, you know, which is a, that's a state level thing, a state and local thing. So our customers, the American people, are one, you know, having to understand the org chart that is government to navigate it for something as essential as exporting your product. And by the way, if you take a day out of an ex export cycle in this country, you actually move GDP in a, in a, in a meaningful way. And you, you have uh, the American citizens out there viewing government as one entity from the state to the local uh, and the federal. And, and so that, you know, as evidenced by that search uh, on USA.gov, or our failings of civics classes, I'm not sure, but, but it, it's, a, it, it's something that I think we really need to think about. How do we have an outside looking in? You know, and the challenge I have for federal agencies out there, and I've talked to actually cabinet secretaries about this, 
if you're doing something great in customer service, let's scale it. Let's think about how you move that across government. Because I think there are shining lights out there where agencies will say, hey, I'm doing a great job. Look at my call center uh, uh, survey results. Look at my website traffic. Look at this. The problem is they're doing that in isolation, and often it doesn't relate to the other things happening around them. But to the American business, the American citizen, person, you know, they, they, they don't understand how to, how to move around in that sphere, so we need to think about that. And employ 21st century technology to do it. Um, you know, there are ways to actually get customer service done uh, in a way that, is, that, is, uh, that seizes upon and, and, and utilizes the latest in innovative technology. The president asked us uh, at one point during the formulation of the management agenda, how come I can't tra track my passport application like I can track a package on Amazon? You know, as one example of how you can employ 21st century technology to do this. On the economic growth side, you know, I mentioned at the beginning of this uh, open data and the importance there. That is going to continue to be a hugely important part of what we do, and I'm excited about the innovation challenge you have all laid forward on thinking about modular and, and bringing that together. I think the, the marrying up of reusability and openness and modularity is so essential to our future and will be the way we, we, get, uh, we, we move the ball forward on this. I think we also need to really think hard about you know, our buying power in government. How are we combining our efforts to really shape the marketplace? Probably the, the biggest uh, point of light on this was the digital strategy and the work that actually Margie did on mobile devices and, and security of mobile devices where we put out a reference architecture for the vendor, the uh, device manufacturing vendor community to look at and, and reference. And now we're starting to see devices built on those specifications. And so it's a, it's a great, uh, uh, great thing in marrying up what was really kind of a phenomenon when I was growing up, which was the, the government would lead the way often in technology or specking certain, certain requirements, and then that would bleed into uh, the private sector and the, the country would benefit from it. On deliver, uh, you know, deliver is about both efficiency how are we saving money? How are we uh, driving uh, efficiency into everything we do? But also, how do we get better results out of our, out of our systems, uh, our agencies, our department, and our people by, while being more efficient? So when you, can you cut costs and deliver better results? I think you can, and there are ways to do that. Um, part of it is, is thinking about how you're, you're delivering better solutions faster. You know, oftentimes when I sit down to agencies and they're, they're talking about something they're doing, I'll say, what can you show me in 60 days? What can you show me in 30 days? How do you think about, it? can you do customer-centric and customer deliverables in those timelines and, and start to drive this, this, uh, this uh, you know, notion of modularity and other things and, and quick delivery into the, into the system? Uh, cult culture of cut and invest and depreciation is also essential. You know, I think a lot of what we do is very protectionist in government, where you wrap your arms around your budget and you say, you know, losing your budget or losing some investment that you're managing is tantamount to you of losing control, losing authority, losing oversight, losing ability to manage, you know, your, your domain. And so we really need to think about how do we inspire a, a culture inside government of cutting what's not working and investing in what is. You know, take from the bottom of the, of the balance sheet, put it at the top. You know, steal from the OPEX column to give to the CAPEX column. We have to figure out how to think about that virtuous cycle that exists more prominently in the private sector of the success of the organization is more important than the success of the small, and to think about how do we then drive the, 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 the reinvestment, um, cut and invest mentality. Buy once, use often is also a key tenet of, of FY14, strategic sourcing. Uh, thinking about how do we how do we scale our, our buying power across the federal government. Uh, Dan has done some uh, breakthrough things with mobile contracts and other things, and I can suspect you're going to see more uh, in that space. Uh, modular, I've talked about, and lowering that risk surface is so important. You know, monolithic failure cannot be the norm in government. We have to get down to, you know, making solutions small and then connecting those solutions together, and so the risk surface goes to the size of the solution that's there. <clears throat> and then the last point is about service-centric organizations. And for this, I've got a little bill, though. So what you often see in, in, uh, in agencies is you have a headquarters office, and in that headquarters office it, uh, is a CIO and a CFO and a CAO and all the, all the C-level executives, the deputy secretary, et cetera, and they run IT for themselves. 
Uh, and then you often see IT running out in these individual bureaus that'll have their own CIO, their own acquisition people, their own finance and budget people and things like that. And they run in such isolation from each other that there's a disconnection. That's where we, it's why we've ended up with you know, the, the you know, multiple email systems in every agency or having uh, procurement motions done in such a way that they're very disconnected. We have thousands of mobile contracts or solutions that get built at the edge where then at some point there's finally a phone call back to the CIO at the headquarters saying, oh, by the way, you need to support this new big project that we just shipped that's completely outside your architecture, completely outside everything else, and I don't have the help desk to manage it, et cetera, and you can just imagine and, and paint the picture and probably reference many agencies and departments around this, this uh, around DC that, uh, that have that. You know, that, that's broken in, in, in many, many ways from the standpoint of just, just the, the, the duplication that exists across these spaces, the, the uh, lack of consistency in architecture, the lack of consistency in cyber, uh, and, and, the, and uh, the people that manage it is, is orders of magnitude more than thinking about this. The other thing it does for me is it takes the, the edge, the people in the bureaus and the offices and the agencies that are part of a department it takes their eye off the ball on what on their mission. You know, I want a CIO to sit out there in those periphery agencies and bureaus, but I want those CIOs to wake up every single day thinking about their mission. You know, I'll give you an example: the the the, the Federal Aviation Administration in the Department of Transportation. I want that. I want there to be a CIO there. I want. I want you know, that job to be attractive with that title, and I want the level of authority to think about that stuff. But if, if they're not coming to work every day thinking about flight safety and going to bed at night thinking about flight safety, we've failed. You know, I would suspect that there are many agencies and departments out there where the CIO shows up at the Bureau office and they're thinking about, is my email up? How's the BlackBerry service doing? What's the throughput of my help desk? Where am I on these commodity uh, uh, contracts and things? And so the model, that, the way this needs to change is one, you know, headquarters needs to own kind of what I will call it commodity, and I will you know, put quotes around that. I know there's, there's sort of a lot of debate out there on what calling things commodity, but you know, services that are pretty common across multiple entities, you know, I'm labeling as commodity services, like email and mobile contracts and, and things like that. Um, plus, I think you need to, the headquarters really needs to be the centerpiece for cyber technology and specifying what cyber is out there. They then need to set up a service-oriented infrastructure that says that when, when these bureaus or offices on the edge of the network come to you and say, hey, I've got an idea for a great new citizen-facing app, you say, great. Here's a development environment as a service. Here's a test environment. Here's a deployment environment. And when you build it in those environments, they're built to our enterprise architecture. They're built to our security standards. We can probably wire up business intelligence, you know, and streamline procurement and all of that sort of stuff. It lets the, the, the edge of the network think about mission every single day, and that's important, and will really yield those, the results we want to see in government. The last key area for us is, is cybersecurity, and there's a, there's a lot happening in cybersecurity from our continuous diagnostics uh, work that's going to, that's going to flourish in, uh, in fiscal year 14, uh, as well as um, uh, FedRAMP. Uh, we've hit, hit 11 uh, providers in the FedRAMP list now, and that continues to grow and is uh, one of the exciting areas that we're uh, driving cloud computing forward. Um, the, the president's fiscal year 14 budget uh, dedicates $13 billion to cyber spread across uh, securing federal networks, the stuff I just mentioned, uh, protecting critical infrastructure in this country. We did an executive order last year that, uh, that guide, is a guiding uh, uh, guidelines for us on how we're actually uh, protecting critical infrastructure, uh, improving incident response in government. So how do we communicate incidents? How do we work with the industry on, on sharing incidents that we see? And then shaping the future cyber environment. I think this is, as anything, at always an evolving target and something that we have to, we have to balance uh, our investment, the work we do uh, to, to meet the needs of cyber. So to close, uh, my call to action for all of you, and, and hopefully you took out some of this from the, from the fiscal year 14 um, uh, priorities for, for me and my team and for federal IT all up, is, is one, you know, just really kind of taking that notion of continuous improvement 
bringing everyone together, communicating that, uh, both at the vendor community and at the agencies, uh, and, and really knowing in yourself that you own that future. You know, the, the, the success or failure of future projects are really about how do we evolve, how do we change, how do we do things differently than the way we've done in the past. We don't use that, that's the, always the way we've done it, or that's always the, the, the path we've taken as the excuse for how we move forward. We have to really create a culture that is about excellence, that's about those impacts that I mentioned, not the tactics, and is about embracing and, and shaping a, a future we wanna see, uh, you know, questioning the norm and, and pushing hard. Then the last point is really engaging the community. I encourage you, you know, forums like this are a great place uh, to do that, uh, as well as just, just getting together and, and, and collaborating and talking and sharing best practices, uh, coming to me if you see things going awry and, and, and things need to, uh, need to evolve. I wanna hear about it. Um, you know, don't be afraid to reach out and, and give me a, a heads up when things are uh, needing attention in a way that, uh, that can move the needle forward. Um, and with that, I will thank you and then welcome, I'm not sure if you're introducing Dan or I'm introducing Dan, but looks like someone is. So thank you very much. Steve, uh, Steve, I just want to thank you. Uh, I want to thank you for your valuable time. Insights that he provided and the strategies for uh, the, this administration into the content for this uh, uh, conference, and I think you'll see that uh, even more so throughout the morning. Thank you, Steve. Thank you. All right, uh, I just want to remind everybody before I announce the next speaker uh, that uh, please update your mobile apps. There's some content, uh, the questions have been updated for the, the CXO that's coming up, so please uh, remember to update your apps so you can be prepared for that. And with that, I'll uh, say that I am now honored to have Dan Tangerlini, the Administrator of the General Services Administration, as our next speaker. Dan was appointed Acting Administrator on April 2nd, 2012, and confirmed by the Senate on June 27, 2013. Prior to coming to GSA, Dan held a number of positions in both the federal government and the District of Columbia government. This morning, he's going to talk about the transformative effects that our changing technology is having on the government. This transformation is giving the federal government a unique opportunity to break down its walls both literally and figuratively to adapt itself for the future. Please join me in welcoming Dan Tangerlini. Good morning, everyone. Uh, it's a real honor and pleasure to be here this morning, and it's a particular honor and pleasure to have the, uh, the chance to follow our, our fantastic Chief Information Officer, Steve Van Rokel. Now, um, part of the excitement of being here this morning was not just the chance to be with all of you, but to, to get a chance to uh, listen to Steve, get my directions uh, going forward uh, as a GSA Administrator. But even better, I had the opportunity to ride down with uh, Steve and his great teammate, Laura, and um, I, I learned a couple of things about Steve. Um, I learned uh, the fact that I'm not the only person who uh, thinks that business casual means don't wear a tie. Apparently, in act I act, it means wear your blue tie. Um, <laughs> the other thing I learned about Steve, I learned yesterday while we were driving down the road, uh, and, and that is something that I really admire about Steve. I really um, am very jealous of. So it's very clear that Steve has children, three, five, and seven, which means that they don't have any ability to touch the radio controls. And uh, I heard more than two successive songs of what my kids would call my music uh, yesterday on the drive down. I also learned that Steve and I share, and oddly Laura, a passion for 70s and 80s classic rock. Um, and I can't tell you. Hold, hold your applause for when I get to the Red Sox. Uh, I can't tell you. When the last time I heard 
Aerosmith, Manfred Mann, and the Cars back to back. <laughs> and and the, the, the four hours I think it took us just to get from 17th Street to 18th Street yesterday <laughs> was like a little mini staycation uh, because of my ability to get in touch with, my, frankly, my roots and my past. Um, but it's an incredible honor to be here, uh, not just to have the chance to um, uh, follow up on Steve's remarks and talk a, a, a bit about the Obama administration's push to try to drive the uh, federal government into the 21st century, but it's a real honor and pleasure to actually have the chance to be here at the ELC and be here with ACT IAC. Uh, you're an incredibly impressive group and you really demonstrate in many ways the kind of leadership and the kind of initiative that we need to have suffused through every part of what we do in Washington. You're breaking down barriers, you're breaking down walls, you're overcoming some of the natural uh, organizational resistance to keep people from collaborating with each other. Uh, it's really a lesson, and I really admire and respect the work that you do uh, in actually embodying the principle of myth busting. The other honor uh, I have uh, is to actually serve in this incredible capacity as a GSA administrator. It's a fantastic organization, a, rare, a very uh, special and unique and important organization. But as Steve pointed out in his slide, the, the key component of that organization, the, the thing that really is the secret sauce are the incredible people, uh, the hardworking, dedicated, committed people who recognize that their role is often not front and center. It's in the background and it's providing the support for the federal government so that they can get their critical missions, their, those agencies can get their critical missions done. I'm also really honored to be able to follow on a set, of, uh, um, a, a set of ceremonies that took place. I gather we had some awards yesterday, and uh, I'm, I'm saying that in part because I gather GSA did a pretty good job in the award ceremony yesterday. And so what I want to do is just take a moment and uh, congratulate all those people who, uh, who got uh, one of these uh, uh, prestigious, important ACT IAC awards. But mostly, I want to congratulate the incredible GSA people who got their awards. So a quick <laughs> round of applause. So in case you're new to our business, like me, I'm, the, I'm a new time person here at ACT I Act uh, and, and here at the ELC. I saw that you had all these great badges around here. I saw the you know, first time uh, new member. Just in case you didn't know uh, what GSA does, uh, we're a, a smaller part of the federal government. We, we are the world's largest provider, though, of office space, about a third of a billion square feet. We do things that to provide basic services for federal government agencies, like 210,000 vehicles. We manage about a third of the federal government's vehicle fleet. I had no idea when I was taking this job that I would be a, um, a car salesman. Um, both new cars to agencies and used cars to you, direct to you, come to me if you want a good bargain. Um, and we also manage about uh, $55 billion of products and services for agencies, helping them connect with the solutions that they need to do their work. And we do this in the context of uh, an organizational structure that um, frankly is robust. Behold the org chart of the United States federal government, the little blue arrow is that agency, that large uh, impactful agency I just described down there. You see kind of over to the left in the second column about halfway down. <clears throat> That's the General Services Administration. Um, but the way this structure was developed was uh, over time, frankly, we began to demand more and more of the federal government. We ask it to do some fundamental things like protect our borders, protect our food, keep planes a safe distance from each other, and on the side, uh, cure cancer. Um, we, we demand and expect an awful lot of it, and the organization, as a result, has uh, gained some robustness and gained some size. As you saw from Steve's slide, uh, the organization also has had, over time, uh, a, a natural tendency to vo uh, vertically integrate, fully vertically integrate, and what you've gotten is, as a result of the, um, the layout of this structure and the, and the way to deliver these services, is you've gotten some redundancy, you've gotten some repetition, you've gotten some duplication. Um, and that, in many ways, represents the great opportunity as we go forward. Not only did we lay out this organization uh, hierarchically and, and, and structurally in the form of our, our org charts, we laid it out physically as well. And it was in, it's incredibly important uh, as uh, in, over the first 200 years of government as the way 
our work actually happened, uh, transacted at the human, the basic human interaction level. It was important that people had visual and clear cues of where they were in that organizational structure. Look, if you sat, if you were standing or sitting, standing on one side, sitting on the other probably, of, uh, of uh, this desk, you knew where you fit in that organization chart. And when business moved as fast as, say, the typewriter or the telegraph, or the railroad, or the telephone, um, it made sense that we had these visual clear cues of how uh, our, our organizational structure worked and how you related to it. Um, but we began to demand more and more of our government. And in the, I'll let this go for a little bit. In the mid-century, we started applying technology, and the technology was working very hard to keep pace with the way our government delivered services. This is, uh, um, frankly, I'm thinking this is going to be the GIF I'm going to put at the end of my emails. Uh, um, uh, this is the way, this is the way we automated our business processes, and you know, for the last 60 or so years, it, it probably worked. That's the robot. Auto pen. That's what its uh, patent name is. It was, uh, it was invented in 1937, and I think it was pretty transformative technology uh, at the time. What's uh, striking, actually, is how many of our processes still end at that device within the organization. We recently moved into our, our new collaborative space in 1800F, and I moved into a space with the Public Building Service Commission, the, the Federal Acquisition Service Commissioner. And as we moved in, they brought in three robot auto pens, one for each. And they could see the horrified look on my face. And they said, don't worry, don't worry, we're going to figure out how to get one to do all, all three of your signatures. And I said, oh, that's close. You're, you're that close. Uh, um, but look, things really began to pick up speed in the last 20 or 30 years. Uh, when I started in the federal government in 1991 at the Office of Management and Budget, these bad boys started popping up on our desks. Uh, by the way, just a quick aside, uh, in 1924, my father was born in uh, uh, Boston, Massachusetts. Uh, did anyone catch the game last night, uh, by the way? Um, I'm not trimming the beard until the, uh, it's not quite as big, but I'm working on it. Um, so uh, uh, in 1924, when my dad was born in Boston, um, the primary form of conveyance in and around the city was, was by horse. My kids are pretty convinced that this is the computer he played video games on when he was a kid. <laughs> they don't actually recognize it as a computer. They think that this is Wally and he lost his legs somewhere. <laughs> um, but this is what was coming onto my desk when I first started as a federal employee. And I remember my first boss at OMB saying to me, look, if we're going to get any of the work done around here, you need to bring it to me on paper. Now, he had one of these on his desk. I don't think it was ever turned on. And he was completely convinced that this whole email thing wasn't really going to catch on. Because who actually could tell the difference between F4 and F10? Um, now think about what we carry around in our pocket. And I remember when I got one of these uh, for the first time six years ago, I felt like I had mugged an alien and stolen their teleporter device. Uh, it's incredibly transformational, the difference, the change. And guess what? Um, consumers have responded. They've responded by, by frankly, using them. In 2000, 2002, the number of people, the total number of people in the world with broadband access, any kind of broadband access, was 32 million. In uh, 2012, just last year, that number was 1.2 billion with broadband access in their pocket. And guess what? People have used them. Uh, 885 petatite, petabytes of data uh, in 2012 is the mobile data traffic. We have started consuming and using this ability to connect, to relate, to communicate, to socialize, to, to uh, interact with the marketplace, to share information, uh, to take pictures, uh, to take movies, We've started using it in a way that we've had to make up uh, what, what we have to start using in normal conversation what sounds like made up and silly words like petabyte. Uh, the mobile data growth between 2011 and 2012 alone is 70%. And I imagine when we get to the end of 2013, we'll see a number that's even more astonishing. And that's had an incredible impact on some basic uh, uh, things, some basic marketplaces, things that have been invented and gone away in just the last 20 years. 
I remember when I was a, a teenager in the 80s, I thought it was a miracle that you could go and actually get a, a, a VHS uh, tape and watch a movie you know, in the, in the convenience of your own home. I thought it was uh, an amazing transformational um, market opportunity and someone came up with the idea of why don't we rent these things to people. And the VHS gave way to the DVD. Today my kids don't even know what that little shiny disc thing is useful for. Um, uh, and you know, there was an entire marketplace that was built up around it from the, from the uh, movie studio to some kind of plant that built these VHSs or DVDs to a distribution channel. Uh, to a brick and mortar uh, retail outlet that you went to or came back, you, you, you tried to rush back so you didn't get those late fees. And uh, in the last three, five years, it's virtually disappeared as people have been able to connect directly uh, through the cloud, uh, almost directly back uh, to the video production folks, to the, uh, to the movie industry. And you're able to use that, uh, what we call the reverse ATM in my house, iTunes or one of the other, uh, uh, one of the other services. Uh, to download um, uh, entertainment and to download uh, uh, media. It's also had a transformational effect on who gets to make movies and who gets to share that information. It's had this massive democratizing effect. I mean, do you think just five or six years ago that your kids would be fluent in Korean singing Gangnam style? <laughs> and that is uh, still, I think, holds the record for the most uh, um, YouTube watches, although what does the fox say is coming up close behind. Um, and this has had an incredible impact on the way that we deliver uh, services, even, even as the federal government, and it's important that we do. Uh, this is the thing that uh, uh, ruined our event last year. This is Hurricane Sandy, Superstorm Sandy. Um, and as Steve pointed out, it had incredibly tragic effects uh, beyond the, uh, the impact of delaying our ability to get together. Um, but one of the things it did was really stress test and prove for us the wisdom, at least in our organization, of recognizing that we need to unfetter our information uh, from our geographic location and unchain our people from their desk and their ability to do their work. Look, it was an incredibly powerful storm and we all heard about the devastation that was wrought on the New Jersey coastline in New York City. It was a great set of articles just this weekend in the Washington Post about um, less heralded uh, impacts on some of our, our Maryland coastal communities. We had the PATH subway uh, just inundated with water and there were questions about how do you even pump that much water out. My favorite as a, a long-standing public servant is the, uh, it's the picture up on the left, a boat on a railroad track. I can't even imagine what the paperwork would be like, uh, how many jurisdictions that crosses. Uh, um, the, the bureaucratic components of that alone boggle the mind. But the simple fact is, in a situation like that, all those barriers, all those separations, all those boundaries between agencies are erased. As agencies scramble to figure out how they can deliver uh, services to a, a public that is in direct need of, um, of that. GSA, uh, had to scramble as well. We had to provide the, um, the materials and the input that agencies needed so that they could uh, reach out to people and that they could frankly get back to work. And we leveraged the investment we had made to move in our critical systems into the cloud uh, and gained uh, a, a deeper experience and understanding for why the, w that decision was not just a really a great financial decision, but an incredibly important operational decision. While we save millions of dollars every year by doing it, what we really gained was a level of resiliency uh, uh, to, to actually bounce back in the face of a, a storm like that. This is uh, one of my incredible, uh, this is my, uh, uh, someone is my hero. This is Allison Arias, uh, a GSA associate who lives uh, in a, an unpronounceable town in uh, New Jersey. Um, that's actually how you pronounce it. Uh, and. Uh, Here's someone whose part of her job was to help agencies get back to work. And what she was able to do was go to the only place in town that had, uh, that had electricity and had Wi-Fi. It was a pep boys. And she was really embodying the spirit of Manny Mo and Jack. She went over there uh, to the pep boys, somehow convinced them uh, to let her sign on to their Wi-Fi. And she, uh, she worked out of that pep boys tying into her critical systems and helping agencies uh, get back to work. And in many ways, uh, that really embodies the spirit of what GSA is supposed to do and how we're supposed to do it. 
in uh, any uh, situation, we're supposed to find ways that we can leverage the scale and scope of the federal government so that it can have positive um, uh, benefits for the people we serve. And we were able to work with um, uh, not only our incredibly uh, 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 important agency partners, but we were able to work with a myriad uh, number of jurisdictions, helping them get uh, their needs uh, met as well. Overnight, our federal acquisition service people were able to get 1,000 chainsaws uh, to uh, New Jersey. 1,000 chainsaws, that's an entire tractor trailer full of, New Jer of, uh, of chainsaws. Where do you find it? How do you make sure you're getting a great price for it? How do you get it where people need it um, the exact next day? That's the kind of work that our folks did. We were able to work with the PATH uh, folks, the, um, the transit folks, who needed uh, some parts that just weren't built anymore, and we were able to collaborate with uh, our industry partners to get some parts built uh, so we could get the PATH back online. And frankly, that's, uh, that's what we need to recognize is that the kind of work we're able to do in an emergent situation is the level of expectation that our, that our ultimate customers, the American people, have for us in everything that we do. You heard Steve talk about the fact that uh, people shouldn't have to know the org chart of the United States federal government in order to figure out a way to interact and get services with it. And frankly, given that that's the org chart, I think that's an incredibly important imperative. And so in the case of Sandy, what we were able to do is uh, looking at each one of our agency partners who each had their own social media presence and each was sending out really important and valuable uh, information out to people about the types of services that they need. We were able to, uh, leveraging APIs, we were able to create a common app that people were able to subscribe to that gave them uh, uh, related feeds from each of the agencies so that they could begin to digest and select the kind of information, the kind of services they needed without having to figure out where to look for them. I mean, how many average people know that the, the weather service is within NOAA, which is within the Commerce Department? How many people, if they're looking to help get their um, some assistance for their house that's been wiped out by a storm know that FEMA is part of the Department of Homeland Security, but if their business, uh, if they need a loan to get their business restarted, they have to go to a separate agency, the Small Business Administration. We need to break down the barriers and the walls that separate the, the way we deliver our services, and we need to do it virtually, as uh, evidenced by that, uh, that social media mashup, and we need to do it, frankly, literally, um, and I mean that in the actual definition of the word, um, by ripping down the walls and the barriers that separate uh, the people who actually do this work. What you're looking at here is, uh, is my office. The desk in the front is my desk. The white arrow is the Public Building Service Commissioner's desk. And the blue arrow is um, the uh, Federal Acquisition Services uh, Commissioner's desk. The office that normally uh, was uh, the uh, domain of the administrator of GSA looked a bit like that one I, um, I showed earlier. In fact, that's a little small compared to the, uh, the GSA administrator's office. Um, and what we've done instead is instead of uh, needing to um, reinforce the hierarchy through the way we've laid ourselves out physically, is we frankly reinforce the mission by laying ourselves out in a way that allows us to collaborate, to communicate, to relate with each other, and share information at the speed that people are actually expecting the work that we're getting done to be performed. We've also developed a number of uh, really powerful tools that are helping to fuel um, this uh, virtual collaboration as well. Great ideas, transformational ideas, frankly somewhat subversive ideas like challenge.gov that change the very paradigm of acquisition from I have a solution and I'm going to, I'm going to define it for you and I'm going to bid, have you bid on how low a price you're going to pay me to, uh, I'm going to pay you to provide that solution to defining more clearly the problem and then challenging people to come up with solutions. Things like USA Search, which has a fantastic price point for agencies at free, uh, which allow us to get better information on how people are actually using uh, agency websites so we can feed that back to the agency so that they can begin to promote certain links and they can get a better understanding of what people are looking for. The Great Ideas Hunt was a, a process we used within the organization to break down uh, hierarchical and organizational barriers and appeal to every one of the great people in GSA to come up with their fantastic ideas about how GSA could be a better organization. FedRAMP is leveraging this notion of once and well 
uh, let's figure out what the standards are, let's uh, certify it once and let everyone use it going forward. And GSA Link, in which we're actually using embedded sensors in our building operation system so that we can engage in what's called continuous commissioning. So we can not only get a sense of when, the agents, when a building isn't performing at its optimal level, we can actually get a sense of when problems may be develop, developing. But the key issue that we confront, frankly, as we deal with this incredible transformation that's wiping across all of our industries, all across the way we deliver our services, the key issue is what I heard um, was a real uh, part of the discussion yesterday in a number of the sessions, and that is the need to confront head-on issues of organizational culture. And one of the most difficult cultural barriers, frankly, is a barrier that all of us were supposed to have overcome somewhere around kindergarten. I'd say at the earlier side of Steve's kids' ages, and that is the ability to share. That's the ability to transfer control, the ability to um, figure out a way to, to cooperate, uh, allow, uh, allow people to work together and, and get a sense that uh, just because you don't possess it in your hands right now doesn't mean that you don't actually have some say over its use and its application. By the way, you're supposed to, when you see this slide, say, aw. Uh, it's okay, good. Uh, we need some more coffee here, if you. Um, but really, what this is about uh, is, is figuring out a way that we can overcome, um, this is a different way of representing our, our org chart, in what we like to call uh, charitably cylinders of excellence. Uh, <laughs> overcoming the, the natural tendency, um, and wait for it, there's GSA. Um, uh, overcoming the natural tendency for our organizations to become fully vertically integrated and to begin to separate uh, from each other. And that happens not just only between organizations, but as Steve pointed out in one of his slides, within organizations at the bureau and the agency level. And I was having a, a, a good conversation uh, last night as I was trying to peer around the person I was talking to to see uh, the Red Sox make sure they got where they needed to go. Um, uh, it also happens within the way we deliver administrative services within agencies, too. We separate the various uh, CX level organizations, and they uh, have a tendency to not uh, collaborate to the extent that they need to. To, cha to overcome some of our biggest administrative services challenges is really going to require the CIO, the CFO, the CAO um, uh, uh, to uh, challenge to work together and figure out what the, the, the collective solution is. And it's going to require the uh, skills and abilities and talents of those people uh, to overcome the natural tendency to separate and to create these barriers. And so frankly, at this point, that's really my challenge to all of you, is to figure out a way that you can um, uh, participate in the process of chipping away at these barriers, uh, to trying to overcome these separations uh, that exist between our agencies. Um, oh, there's a really good slide in there somewhere, um, but I'll describe it for you. Uh, it's a guy chipping away at this kind of inscrutable wall. Here you go. Um, and that's what I'm asking you to do, is pick up the sledgehammer and start uh, chipping away at those barriers, those things that separate industry from government, uh, from agency to agency, from part of agency, from bureau to agency and start asking yourselves how we can be part of the solution of tearing down these silos. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. At this point, pardon me. Yeah, we're going to do Q&A, so we're going to bring uh, Dan and Steve back up to the stage, please. Thank you. So who's got the first question for Steve? Yeah. 
He'll be handling all the hard ones. So one, uh, my question is for both of you, but uh, I'll brown those a little bit um, to the administrator. I want to congratulate you on the openness and the use of technology in your platform around GSA Oasis. No matter what industry um, thinks about what you decided about that procurement, it absolutely was open. We had uh, very, very open and constant, frequent dialogue with you, and I congratulate you. I think that is a model for interaction with, uh, between industry and government in the future around procurement. So let me just quickly say that all the compliments go to the great GSA, uh, FAS, and OASIS team. Um, uh, they, you know, they've really done an incredibly admirable job. They've taken on uh, a bunch of issues that people are very much interested in seeing us pursue. And um, if there's any problem, if there's any complaint, if there's any blame, I'll take all of that. So, uh, but thank you very much to the FAS Oasis team for, for really putting together something I think that's particularly special. And thanks for pointing that out. So the question is, what um, institutional change do you see, either legislative, uh, mandates from OMB, um, that will get around this um, stovepiping uh, between headquarters and bureaus? We've been talking about it for decades. Uh, no company would run their business with, you know, the number of financial management systems, HR systems that the government has even in a single department. Um, what will allow us, uh, besides just chipping away, uh, as we've been doing for, for decades, to make logical decisions uh, about these systems? You want to start? Sure, I can start. So I think the, the the key difference now than we've maybe seen in the past is first the, the fiscal pressure. Just the, 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 the necessity to cut costs is so real in our face with sequester and other things that I think that's going to just force some behavior change. That's not the way you want to get to that outcome. It, it's going to be one of the elements that gets us there. Uh, there will be, you know, in strategic sourcing and some of the other things we do, some OMB guidance and other things that we will do. But I think the key uh, right now is really having organizations embrace the notion of two-way customer service. Because I think so much, you know, if you look at the history of organizations, there's always this ebb and flow of centralization and decentralization. You know, if you want to get something operationalized, you typically centralize it, and then you scale it, you decentralize it, and then there's all these crazy things. Well, we've seen that, you know, the history of the government, we've, we've kind of leaned harder to the decentralization uh, side. But I think that the, the, the key of, of, of getting uh, to where we want to go, of, of more consolidation, especially on the commodity side and other things, is two-way customer service. It's getting, you know, not just this notion of taking away for centralization, not going out and saying, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to take away your email system, I'm going to take away your help desk, I'm going to take away your procurements here and there, but saying, I'm going to take those things, I'm going to give you better service than you had before at a lower cost. Um, and, and I'm going to assign people in, in the headquarters to work with you directly to make sure that your voice is heard in the right conversations, that you're well represented, that you know, we give you capabilities that are above and beyond what you probably had before. Um, you know, and, and getting that connection, that two-way connection established is so essential. And in the agencies where you saw this happen, DHS was one of them where they stood up customer service reps that would actually reach out and touch the, uh, the, uh, the, the bureaus and things outside. You saw success. And that, I think that is, uh, it's essential because if, if I feel like I'm, I'm sitting in a bureau and you're going to take something away from me and I have, not, I have suddenly lose control, I lose my budget that was overseeing that, that investment and, and, uh, and my service potentially goes down. Uh, that's not a great experience, and we'll, we'll quickly get unraveled, I think, if you don't, uh, don't deal with it. No, I, I, I think um, Steve's point's a, an excellent one. I, I think really to follow up on, on your, the key point of your question was what specific legislation or policy changes is, gonna, is going to help us begin the, the process of uh, radically transforming business, um, uh, the way we deliver our business, and, I, and I'd argue that actually it's neither of those things. I think those things will have uh, the effect of maybe giving people uh, who are really hesitant permission or frankly authority or, 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 or a kick in the pants, but what's really going to drive it is the expectation of the people that we serve. And the fact is that as more and more people carry these things around and have an interaction, a, a um, 
transactional interaction that's at the speed of light whenever they want it, wherever they want it, they're going to have a reasonable, frankly, expectation that their government will be able to provide a reasonable facsimile of that. And I look at what, you know, how my, uh, say my 16-year-old daughter uh, studies, she, how she does her work. And uh, it looks a bit like the Starship Enterprise. She's got her laptop open, and she's got her iPad going, she's texting at the same time. The grades are good, so I can't complain, but it's, uh, it's a little intimidating how much um, interaction. I've got five kids on the video screen. I gotta be careful what I wear around the house now. Um, <laughs> Uh, I got I to gotta at least wear business casual everywhere <laughs> I go. Um, so uh, uh, that's the expectation that people have of the way service is going to be delivered. And that's going to drive the systems and the processes to, uh, to meet that expectation. In uh, 1955, two characters were born that created a force field that influences everybody in this room. Uh, Steve Jobs and Bill Gates. Uh, suppose uh, either of those characters were had your respective jobs. How do you think they would do them differently than what you're doing them? <laughs> that's that's all you, buddy. <laughs> so. You know, my wife will ask me these you know these questions, these hard questions, and I'll say. Honey, that's a fantastic question. And she'll look at me and she'll say, that's a terrible answer. Um, so, you know, first of all, I'm not sure uh, Steve Jobs or Bill Gates would take these jobs. They just don't pay enough. Uh, sure. No, I, I think that's a, it actually is interesting. The, the question is, if you're Steve Jobs and Bill Gates and you get to work in a world in which the, the paper is completely clean sheet and you get to design things, uh, what I read the, um, the book about jobs, and one of the things he had to teach the people to do is stop looking at anything referential as they develop this thing. And he said, look, I don't care what people want. I'm going to give them what they don't even know that they want. I can't imagine a government that works that way. I, I, I'm not sure that would even be a good thing. To some extent, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs were a successful outcome of a, a private sector entrepreneurial system that says failure is an incredibly uh, powerful tool, it's a useful tool. Um, we don't really accept failure at the, we don't accept failure, frankly, at the 0% level within government. I think the real uh, lesson we can learn from the success of people like uh, Bill, uh, Bill Gates and Steve Jobs is saying that within our organizations, leaders such as Steve and I should allow people to experiment, should give them cover, uh, should give them protection, and allow for the fact that if you really are going to push the envelope, if you really are going to innovate, there may be some mistakes that happen along the way. The question is, how can then we get support from people like you in the industry and out in the world? How can we get political support? And how can we get support from the citizens to say, it's OK if you were trying to do something ambitious and you didn't get it right the first time. What we're going to look for is to see if you can come back and do it the second or the third time and really come up with something special. And if you look at the career particularly of Steve Jobs, that is a career that isn't entirely one that's defined by success. There was an awful lot of mistakes and failure that happened along the way before we got to this notion that here's this uh, transformational thing that just kind of uh, popped out. There were a lot of mistakes that were made along the way. There were a lot of opportunities uh, uh, to learn, uh, as, as Steve pointed out in his pre presentation, having these teachable learning moments. The real issue for us then is giving our folks cover to go back and do it again and making sure that we actually are taught something and learn something from those moments. Yeah, and I, I, I totally agree. Having worked side by side with Bill for uh, many, many years and, and met Steve a few times, I think, you know, the, um, I think we're, we're running federal IT and, and, uh, and GSA much in the, in the vision they would, in, they would uh, embrace, which is giving people room for innovation, thinking about customers, thinking about how do we continue to improve and, and learn and embrace, uh, embrace uh, continuous uh, innovation and improvement in, in everything we do. Um, I think I'm, we probably yell a little bit less than they would, but, uh, but uh, I, I, other than I that, uh, <laughs> other than that, I think it's, uh, you know, it's, it's, you know, I think, I think we learn from those, uh, those great Americans and can take it into, into government, as should all of you.
you're really talking about the risk-reward ratio. With big rewards, you have more risk. So I appreciate what you're saying about giving cover, but in the procurement process, too often uh, uh, risk adversity prevails. So how do you overcome that? I don't know if you overcome risk adversity, and I'm not sure if you're spending the American taxpayer's money. I don't. I, I want to have a an environment in which there is no adversity to risk. I want people to realize that this isn't like an investment you make in a company which you can sell on the stock market. Look, if you don't continue to invest in my company, we come looking for you. And so there has to be some sense. <laughs> you figured that out. Uh, there has to be some sense that you know, what we're dealing with is a special and precious commodity. And so that there has to be some sense that there is some risk. Now the question is, how do you structure the way you go into a difficult process so that you're not fronting all the risk all at once right at the beginning? And I think that that's part of the, the transformational process and the way we deliver things. It's not necessarily the procurement process per se, but it's the process that leads up to the procurement and our willingness to break things into uh, something that Steve has uh, you know, virtually evangelized about the, the idea that you have these modular pieces and you're looking for you know, the fail fast opportunity, looking for the things that you can develop quickly, see, test, see how they relate, and then move on and try to build iteratively towards uh, the big bang outcome. Yeah, I think, I think you know, going small and, and thinking about those modulars, modular approach lowers the risk surface. The goal here is to fail fast and learn quickly and then from that learning scale into new things that you do. If you're, you've got a project that five, six, seven years down the road, you suddenly learn something you did in year one wasn't the right approach, that's not gonna work in, in the 21st century. So we need to think about how do you, how do you fail fast, lower the risk surface so the pain of the, of the failure is not you know, so, so pervasive that it takes down the whole thing, but instead uh, learn, learn quickly and then scale quickly throughout that. And I think you know, the, the risk in procurement to some degree in my mind is, is about that procurement official maybe not picking the lowest price, but picking the one that's gonna have the best yield long term and, and thinking about bringing innovation into that process is, is so essential as well. All right. Whoops. Microphone, there we go. I just wanted to do a shout out to the team the quadrennial team that did a paper on the alignment of the CIO with mission. And when I saw your comments about the role of the CIO and, and the changing um, structure that you're envisioning, uh, it seemed very much in alignment with what that team did. And, and I felt remiss in not bringing that to everyone's attention. So all the CIOs here, I hope you'll all take a minute and, and look at that paper as well. So uh, not awesome. a question, just a, an acknowledgement and hopefully a resource for you. Awesome. I want to thank both of you gentlemen for coming. It's been a thrill seeing Steve again. Um, I am from DAU. Um, we have just been given the prize of the best corporate university in the world. Wow. Last year we did about 12 million hours of instruction time to government and industry and um, uh, military. In the course of my work at DAU and also my volunteering in the community as a volunteer fire chief, a lot of young people come to me and they say, Chris, you work for the government. Why would I want a job in the government? And I have not been able to come up with a really good answer, especially with the sequester and everything else. But with all the people retiring and leaving and the headhunters robbing our stores for young people come and work for me, uh, I'll pay you $30,000 over your government salary and you'll never be called non-essential again. What do I tell to young people who are saying, should I work for the government? Should I have a career with Uncle Sam? I think that's an easy answer. Um, and it's all of, and this speaks from my just life experience, having spent time in the other world and then come to this one, um, and that's uh, impact at scale. It, you know, when I, throughout my Microsoft career, and I worked at Microsoft right out of college and 
was there till 2009, I had lots of opportunities to do pretty incredible things from being Bill Gates' assistant, helping him transform the Gates Foundation from technology to world health. I was in, I was in India, New Delhi, India with him the first time we dropped polio vaccines into children's mouths in a slum clinic in New Delhi. And now India has been, an, uh, 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 polio has been announced eradicated from India in the last year and a half, you know, and the world is at 99% eradicated for polio. Helped launch, helped the team at Microsoft launch Xbox. I helped launch Windows XP, did all these things. Uh, and I thought to myself during this, these experiences of doing this stuff that I was at the pinnacle of my career for having worldwide impact. And little did I know that coming to the federal government uh, would greatly, by orders of magnitude, outpace what you could do in a, one, a private sector company, even the world's largest software company, uh, in, in the impact you can drive. You know, the fact that you can come here and as a 20-year-old, a 25-year-old, a 28-year-old, you know, deal with, uh, you know, budget totals that are, are greater than the GDP of many countries out there. You can help shape policy worldwide. You can help shape uh, things for the public good and, and really change the world, I think, is just, is just the incredible part of it. The other part of it is, is just the breadth of experience that you would have. You look at the, uh, the vacancy we, we have right now in the, in the uh, CIO of the of, uh, Department of Veterans Affairs and the size of the budget, the workforce, everything, uh, you know, presents opportunities for people, you know, albeit the pay is under market uh, uh, rates, but the level of experience you would get as, as probably the world's largest customer for most, most vendors out there. Uh, is, is unparalleled. And so I think there's both the, you're gonna get the, the incredible life experience, you're gonna drive the stuff forward from the standpoint of, of having impact as well as you're gonna get practical skills uh, coming to government and, and be able to apply those. So. I actually, I'm not sure if I'm the best person to answer the question because other than a short stint at Burger King and at a mobile gas station, <laughs> I've, I've never done anything but work in public service. but. Um, I will tell you, I mean, you listen to someone as impressive and uh, someone who has uh, you know, done as much as Stephen Rokel, who uh, actively chose and sought an opportunity to serve his country. Um, I think that that's a very powerful message. If you listen to um, the Presidential Innovation Fellows, people who are doing the coolest stuff in the coolest place, dropping everything to come and serve their nation. I actually live in a house full of young people. I have two of my own, and I seem to have half the world's others uh, coming through at any given time. And I will tell you, I have not sensed a diminution in patriotism, in pride, in a sense of duty and honor. And there's no better place, there's no better place to scratch that itch, to have impact, as Steve described, to be a part of history and to make a change than in public service. And so it's just been a huge pleasure and honor for me to have as many years as I've had to, uh, to uh, do that work. But what's particularly uh, valuable about it is when I get to work beside people like uh, Casey Coleman, our fantastic uh, CIO, Dave McClure, Kathy Conrad, you heard from Lena Trudeau, uh, Mary Davey, an, an, an incredible award winner, and all the folks in GSA, part of a bigger family of folks who get up every day trying to figure out how to make their country a better place. It's a great reward. And I, and I can't wait till those psychic stock options, uh, you know, hit their, uh, hit their Patriot, price point. Patriotic yeah. stuff. Yeah. One more question. All right. Uh, this question is for uh, Steve, but I uh, would love to hear Dan. Uh, uh, when you put up your quadrant of uh, you know, innovate, protect, deliver, and people, there was a very, very important word in the middle, uh, analyze, right. that you didn't really talk too much about. But I want to hear, uh, how do you instill a culture of analysis within government agencies? who are so good at complying, so good at uh, operationalizing, but an analysis is at the root of good decisions, and uh, I would like I'd love to hear your opinions on it. I think Dan could actually be a really good. Well, no, I appreciate it. I think actually, I, w I, I, I love the idea of putting analysis in there as kind of the, uh, as the glue that binds those four blocks together. And then I would surround it. I would shrink wrap it in collaboration. And the way you actually get folks to, um, 
uh, focus on, on the need for analysis. And I, I, I joke, we're really good at data in the federal government. We can produce all the data you want. The big problem, what's missing, particularly at the C-suite level, is information. And converting data to information requires analysis. It requires that thoughtful exercise of trying to discern what the important trend is or what the important relationship is. And the best way to do that is not to go and, and close your door and, and, and unlock yourself alone in a room. It's to find other people and find ways that you can push ideas and, and challenge each other, that you can break down. I, I like Steve's idea of the risk surface. I mean, we have a risk surface in just basic human interactions within the federal government. There's concern about you know, raising yourself too high or being too controversial or being too out there. How do we as leaders encourage people to say, get together, work together, collaborate, because from that we'll, become, we'll have the opportunity to really provide that meaningful analytical layer. There's a whole other set of training, of tools, of experience, of best practices that we also as leaders have to provide our folks. But it starts with really encouraging people to work together and then at the C-suite demanding uh, better analysis uh, in the form of useful, actionable information. And then I, as I mentioned earlier, um, you know, the natural human tendency is to fly at the level of the tactical. You come to a, a conference room with a, with a problem and you say, I've got a problem, you lay it on the table. People around the table say, I know what to do about that. I know what to do, and they'll throw tactics out on the table. And, and what, what is disconnected is both the outcome you're trying to drive. I described that earlier. You know, define the thing you're wanting to accomplish six, year, six months from now, a year from now, work your way backwards from it. But also, how, you, how do you measure the fact that you're getting there is so essential. And so I think you know, instilling this culture and, and thinking about um, you know, what we do inside government. You know, I, I, challenge, I often challenge people around government to you know, go back to their desk and write a mission statement. Think about you know, what the mission of their, of their effort is, their organization. Write uh, a set of values and a vision for what you're trying to accomplish, and then tick down the list of going through objectives, goals, strategies, and metrics that can then accrue to this stuff. I've taken this so far that in my own life, um, when I would incubate a new product or a project inside government or for, um, for when I change jobs, I actually write, I do a, it's all hypothetical, but I write the press release for the last day, the day I ship that product or the day I'm finishing that job I'm taking uh, on the first day. I just, I, I carve out part of the day on the very first day and I, I literally write this thing. I never release them. They're all in a thumb drive, securely in a fire safe in my house. Uh, so no one can see them because I'm often wrong. But, but at least what it gives me it's, is it gets me two things. One is it allows me to, to focus on the important over the urgent. Because in government, you know, and, and is it anywhere in life, the urgent things that hit you all the time will overtake the important work that you do, and you'll just spend your time doing urgent things, not important things that are going to accrue. And two is gives me a sense of how to measure where I am to get to that outcome I want to drive. And so I think us bringing in the science of thinking about measurement, um, I, you know, I think there is there are systematic ways to do this. Um, uh, in the president's 14 budget, I actually added a section. Uh, in there that talks about evidence-based uh, initiatives in government where you can build uh, data reference architectures and then start to build measurement mechanisms for programs inside government. So if we know we're doing 10 things, you know, to, to do some, some tactical thing inside government, getting measurements of that and then being able to compare them and optimize and spend on the ones that are working and, and defund the ones that aren't working. Uh, is, is, is critical. I've done this in federal IT through the IUIT uh, fund, and we, we have a, I have a special team, very modest, small investment was able to get me a team that, uh, that is able to um, do data analytics. So now I know what a mailbox should cost in government. I know what the average cost of a mobile contract is. I know things that I can now measure and understand and then hold up to agencies to say you're, you're way off the, off the average in a way that you need to do some corrective action here. And so I, I can carry that forward and that's, that's what we bring forward in our portfolio stat sessions and we have those discussions about those numbers. It's a very data-driven driven review, uh, the, the evidence-based effort in the 14 budget was to take the th what I've learned in, in, in IT and scale that into the rest of government. Great. Well, Great. thank you very much. Thank everyone. you.
So I'd like to thank Steve and Dan for their fascinating insight. Please join me in giving them a round of applause.